button. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone for today's seminar. Um, we have a sign-in sheet on the side table, as most of you know. Uh, you can sign in to leave your name so I know how many attendees we have. And then you can also give us your email address if you'd like to be on our uh, seminar email list. Uh, we also have announcements for our uh, upcoming seminars over there and for the schedule for the rest of this spring. The next seminar is going to be on March 28th. So uh, for today's seminar, we have a number of people listening online. So we're going to ask uh, that we hold all of our questions to the end. And then you can ask your questions and we'll also um, answer those uh, online. Those people can just type in their questions and we'll read them um, at the end. So today, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. John Kelly from Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, John is Associate Professor in the Biology Department. He received his PhD in Microbial Ecology from Rutgers University, which is now a Big Ten University. Uh, John's research interests are in microbial ecology and the analysis of complex microbial communities. His research uses state-of-the-art molecular techniques to gain insight into the structure and function of microbial communities in both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. He's got a number of current projects um, they are on environmental impacts of nanomaterials. His work that he's going to talk about today, which is environmental impacts of pharmaceuticals and personal care products in the environment. Uh, inter Actions between uh, pathogens and biofilms and drinking water distribution systems, uh, nanoarray development, ecology of paraphytic biofilms, that's uh, algae and bacteria interactions in aquatic ecosystems, as well as a study he's doing on the impacts of elevated atmospheric carbon dioxide on microbial communities to assess what's happening here with the climate change and increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So with that, um, very happy to have John here today to talk about a project. This was partially funded through our sponsored research program here. John's just finishing that up and worked with uh, John Scott on the project. So Dr. Kelly, thank you. So thanks very much for the introduction, Nancy. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation to come down here and talk to you guys today. Um, so, as Nancy said, I'm a microbial ecologist, so my area of interest is how anthropogenic inputs can affect the composition and function of complex microbial communities. And my lab uses molecular biology techniques to try to determine the sort of taxonomic and species composition of microbial communities as a real sensitive indicator to responses to anthropogenic inputs. Uh, I think one of the ideas behind our work is that studies that simply look at, for example, the numbers of bacteria in a system and their response to a pollutant can miss changes in species composition that are really significant and really show the responses of communities to things like pollutants. So I'm going to be talking today about a project that, as Nancy said, was funded by ISCC. So I want to right up front acknowledge them and thank them for the funding support for this project. Um, I also want to thank my collaborators, uh, Emma Rosie Marshall from the Cary Institute in New York. Uh, John Scott from ISTC, and then uh, Teresa Chow and Monty Wilcox, and two former ISTC staff members who were involved in early stages of, of this project. So as a lot of us are aware, there's growing concern in the ecological community about the potential environmental impacts of a number of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. And this term, PPCPs, generally refers to things like prescription and over-the-counter over drugs, antibiotics, disinfectants, soaps detergents, cosmetics, so a whole range of different compounds. And most of these things are used by humans because they have some type of biological impact, that they interact in some way with biological systems. And we're using a lot of these compounds more and more and more frequently, and so higher and higher concentrations of them are entering into the environment. And there's a lot of questions about what potential impacts these compounds could have in the environment. So it was a really famous and well-known survey done by the USGS back in 2000. They published this in 2002 in ESET, where they surveyed um, 139 streams in the United States looking for a suite of 95 different uh, pharmaceutical type compounds. And they intentionally biased this survey towards streams that they thought would have contamination. They picked streams that were downstream of urban areas where they thought they would find these compounds. 
pounds. But uh, they found these contaminants in over 80% of the stream. Now, generally, they were at relatively low concentrations, but the abundance of these things was quite, uh, was quite interesting. And some of the most, so this graph up here shows you the distribution of the streams that they sampled. So you can see the bias towards sort of major urban areas. And uh, this table here shows you how frequently uh, compounds from different categories were detected in these streams. So again, over 80% of the streams had at least one of these contaminants in them. The most commonly detected compounds were steroids, insect repellents, caffeine, triclosan, fire retardants, and detergent metabolites. And so I became very interested in looking at this compound triclosan because it is an antimicrobial compound, is an antibacterial compound, but it's not used as an antibiotic. It's not chemotherapeutically useful. You don't take it to treat disease. It's generally used as a disinfectant but it does have significant antibacterial properties and it is used a lot. So this is the structure of triclosan. So it's a synthetic compound. It was discovered in the 1970s. And at first, it was mostly used in hospitals as a disinfectant. This was in the you know, 1970s, 80s. But in the mid-90s, they realized that the general public had a lot of interest in buying products that were antibacterial. And so they began putting triclosan in a wide array of different commercial products. And it's now found in over 700 different commercial products, ranging from things like soaps, hand wash, uh, uh, laundry detergent, dishwashing detergents, um, lotions, toothpaste, mouthwash. They've also figured out ways to embed triclosan into plastic. So you can buy plastic items like cutting boards that have triclosan in them. If you ever go to the supermarket, and the shopping carts have those plastic handles, and they say microban on them. Microban is the trade name for plastic embedded triclosan. So those plastics have triclosan in them. You can buy cutting boards. You can buy a high chair for your baby that has triclosan embedded in the plastic because of its antibacterial properties. It's also embedded in textiles. So you can buy socks and underwear that have triclosan in them as well just to keep the bacteria away. So we're using this stuff a lot. And so because most of these uses are in soaps and detergents and things, it's naturally going to enter into the domestic wastewater stream, right? We use these materials and they get flushed down the drain, whether it's in your washing machine, your dishwasher, hand soaps. So they find a lot of triclosan in uh, domestic wastewater. And a number of studies have looked at what happens to triclosan when it gets to a wastewater treatment plant, right? So the water from our homes, when you live in an urban area, generally gets treated in a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, these plants, it turns out, are quite good at removing triclosan. They remove about 95% of the triclosan. Now, the majority of that removal comes from partitioning of the triclosan to the sludge. So a lot of it ends up in the sludge, which is a whole other environmental issue that I'm not dealing with. But a lot of that sludge, especially in Illinois, ends up getting land applied, and there could be significant concentrations of triclosan in there. Uh, and about, 50, uh, about uh, a good percentage of it also gets degraded. So it, Triclosan can be debated fairly effectively under aerobic conditions. But the removal is not 100%. So there are measurable amounts of triclosan coming out in wastewater effluent. And a number of studies have looked at that and detected with triclosan in wastewater effluent. So one of the things we hypothesized in our study was that even though treatment plants remove it fairly effectively, that the effluent could still be a sort of steady supply of a low but consistent concentration of triclosan to surface waters and freshwater ecosystems. The other interesting feature is that most studies that have gone out into the environment and looked for triclosan mostly look in the water, like the Colvin study. But triclosan is a hydrophobic compound and has a very low aqueous solubility. It's going to have a tendency to partition to organics or to the sediment. And so we thought, and they've also shown, other studies have shown, that triclosan in the sediment is fairly resistant to degradation that it, they've had studies that have shown detected triclosan in sediments that were over 30 years old. So when it gets into anaerobic conditions, it's resistant to degradation. So our hypothesis was that if there's a low amount of triclosan coming out of the effluent all the time, and it's going to partition to the sediment, and it can stay there and not be degraded, there's the potential for large amounts of triclosan to build up in sediments downstream of treatment plants. So, and we were interested to figure out how this triclosan might be affecting microbial communities in the benthos. So the benthic microbes includes organisms in the upper layers of sediment or attached to solid surfaces in a river or a stream. 
So these organisms could potentially be seeing high concentrations of triclosan. We know triclosan is an antibacterial compound. So we were interested to find out what the potential impact on these organisms could be. And impact on microbes in the benthos is significant ecologically because these organisms contribute a lot to stream function. Right? They drive a lot of the primary production in streams. They drive a lot of the nutrient cycling in streams. So if things are having a negative impact on benthic microbes, that could be significant ecologically. And what do we know about triclosan effects on bacteria? So from previous studies, we know that triclosan is toxic. Its mode of action is that it binds to a particular enzyme, this enzyme up here, this enoyl acyl carrier protein reductase, which is involved in lipid synthesis. So it binds to and inactivates this enzyme. Bacteria can't make lipids. If they can't make lipids, they can't make cell membranes. They can't grow. So it inhibits bacterial growth by binding to this one particular enzyme. And a number of studies have also shown that bacteria can develop resistance to triclosan in the lab. So if they expose bacteria in a lab to low levels of triclosan, over time they'll develop resistance. And there are a number of mechanisms that they found. They can develop resistance through mutations in this FAB1 gene, which is the gene that encodes that enzyme. So a mutation in the gene causes a change in the structure of the enzyme, oops, um, which can generate resistance in the bacteria. Some bacteria can also become resistant through overexpression of the gene. So they can simply make more of the enzyme to overcome the inhibition from triclosan. And finally, there are a number of efflux pumps that have been discovered. And efflux pumps are membrane-bound pumps that bacteria can use to actually pump out antibiotics, including things like triclosan. So some bacteria can be resistant to these things by simply throwing them back out. As soon as they enter the cell, they pump them back out. And several studies have suggested a link between triclosan resistance and resistance to other chemotherapeutically useful antibiotics. So for example, some of these efflux pumps can sometimes pump out more than one class of antibiotics. So the concern here is that if we're exposing bacteria to lots of triclosan, they may develop resistance not only to triclosan, but also to other potentially therapeutically useful antibiotics. So some reasons to be concerned. So we developed a couple of research questions for this project and a couple of hypotheses. So our first question was, was about the wastewater treatment plants, right? So we, we wondered, are treatment plants with this potentially small but continuous dose of triclosan, are they significant point sources for triclosan entry into freshwater ecosystems? And so our hypothesis was that, yes, they were. And so we hypothesized that if we sample streams, upstream and downstream, of treatment plant inputs, that we would see higher concentrations of triclosan at the downstream points. That was our hypothesis. The second question was, if we could find triclosan in these sediments, would it be impacting the microbial communities? Would it impact bacteria in those sediments? Would the concentrations be high enough to actually have an effect? And so we developed three hypotheses about that. We hypothesized that the triclosan, as an antibacterial compound, would reduce the abundance of bacteria in the sediments. It would cause them to develop resistance, as we had seen in laboratory studies. And it would also potentially alter the taxonomic composition of the bacterial communities. In other words, perhaps some bacteria would be more sensitive, would die out quicker. Other bacteria might be more resistant to triclosan. So these were the hypotheses we wanted to test. So we did an experiment field project where we went out and sampled three different uh, streams in the Chicago region. We picked three sites that varied in their degree of urbanization or the degree of uh, human impact. So our urban site was the North Shore Channel on the north side of Chicago, right in the city of Chicago, Illinois. Our suburban site was the west branch of the DuPage River, which is out in DuPage County, one of the uh, Chicago suburbs, which is where Naperville is. And finally, we also chose a site much farther from the city that we thought would be less, have less human impact. This is Nipperson Creek, which is in McHenry County, Illinois, which is within a, a nature preserve area. So this is about the cleanest stream that we could find and still be in northern Illinois. Right? So it's the best that we could do. So we had these three different sites. And these are the locations. So here's a map of, uh, of the northern part of Illinois. Here's Cook County, which includes Chicago. This is the north branch of the, of the Chicago River here. And the North Shore Channel is shown right here. That was our urban site. I should mention really quickly that the North Shore Channel is not actually a real stream or river. It's actually a man-made canal that was built at the turn of the century when they were you know, changing the flow of the Chicago River. 
So they actually built this channel to connect Lake Michigan to the North Atlantic Chicago River. But now, it's been there for more than 100 years, it functions just like an urban river. It has a natural substrate, and it functions as an urban river. That was our urban site. Our suburban site out here in DuPage County, on this map, the colors represent population density, right? So you can see in Cook County and Chicago, very, very high population density, lower pop density out in the suburbs, and then here is our woodland site out at Nipperson Creek, much, much lower population density. So those were our three sites. So these three sites differed significantly, obviously, in land use. Right? If you look at the urban site, the North Shore Channel, it's uh, over 70% either residential or commercial and industrial land. So a lot of urban development. Our suburban site, much more even distribution of land use. And here there's some significant amounts of ag, forest, and vacant land. So a significant amount of open territory. And then finally, our woodland site, you can see it's uh, much more significantly open land and very little commercial or uh, industrial development at the uh, woodland site. So those were our three sites. This is a satellite photo of our urban site, so this is the North Shore Channel. So the North Shore Channel receives a direct input of effluent from the North Side Water Reclamation Plant, which is a really large urban wastewater treatment plant. This treats wastewater from the northern part of the city of Chicago and also some of the northern Chicago suburbs. Its uh, average flow is 250 million gallons per day. And so this is, a, this is a photo of the plant right here, including all of this stuff here. It's very large. Not the biggest one in Chicago, but it's a very, very large urban wastewater treatment plant. And its input is right here. So the river flows from top to bottom in this picture. These were our two sampling sites. We were about uh, 800 meters upstream and then about 100 meters downstream of the effluent input. So at the urban site, we had an upstream and a downstream location. Here's our suburban site. This uh, is the West Branch of the DuPage River. This receives input from the West Chicago treatment plant, a smaller suburban plant. This one treats 5 million gallons per day. And this was 250 million gallons per day, so it's 50 times smaller treatment plant. So we again sample at the site upstream and a site downstream of the treatment plant. And then finally, this is our woodland site, Nipperson Creek. So you can see the, the much, much lower population density and human impact of this site. This stream actually flows from bottom to top in this picture. So upstream of our sampling site, there's a fair amount of just sort of wooded area. So at each of these sampling sites, we collected five uh, water samples and five sediment samples. So at each of those five sites, um, we measured trickle sand concentrations in the sediments by accelerated solvent extraction followed by uh, tandem mass spec. And when I say we, what I mean is John. <laughs> John Scott did this work. Um, uh, so if you have any questions about the trickle sand measurements, please don't ask me, ask John. Um, and then we profiled the sediment bacterial communities looking at bacterial abundance, at community trickle sand resistance, and at bacterial community composition. So we looked at bacterial abundance by a very simple method, which is just directly counting the cells. So we take a sediment sample, we mix it up in a buffer solution, run it through a membrane filter, fluorescently stain the bacteria, and then actually manually count them under the microscope. So we get a count of the bacterial abundance. To measure the community trickle sand resistance, we used a plate count method. So we again extracted the bacteria from our sediment, did a series of dilutions in a buffer, and then plated them on auger plates. And so we had two types of auger plates. We had clean soy auger plates, and then we had plates that were amended with trickle sand at 16 milligrams per liter. There was nothing magical about this concentration of trickle sand, but we did an initial test where we used sediment from the clean site, the woodland site, and we measured, checked it on different concentrations of trickle sand to see what would give us a significant decrease in growth. And so this concentration killed like 95% of the bacteria in the Nipperson Creek site. So it resulted in a significant toxicity. So we chose that as our cutoff for trickle sand resistance. And so our resistance numbers are percentage. The number of bacteria growing on the trickle sand plates divided by the number of growing on the unamended plates. That's our resistance level. And then for bacterial community composition, we used a sort of cutting edge molecular biology technique known as pyrosequencing. So I don't want to go into detail on this method because it's not kind of boring, but the method basically is an incredibly high throughput approach for doing DNA sequencing. It was developed in the 1990s. It's used a lot for doing whole genome sequencing now. So it gives you a massive amount of data in a short period of time, over 700 megabases of DNA sequence in 23 hours. The runs are relatively short, 
300, I should have changed this. This 1,000 is ridiculous. The company says that, but it's more like three to 400 base pairs you can get from a run. And it's got many applications, like I said, a lot of it being in genome sequencing. But microbial ecologists like me have developed a little trick that we can use to make this assay really useful for doing population surveys. And this is known as tag higher sequencing. So what we do is we take our bacterial community, we extract the DNA, we amplify a particular gene, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which is used for bacterial identification and phylogenetics. We amplify that gene, but the trick we use is that each sample gets amplified with a specific molecular tag on the PCR primer so that the amplicons from each sample have a unique, what's called a barcode, a unique eight-base DNA sequence that's attached to sequences only from that sample. We then mix all of our samples together in one pool and have it pyrosequenced. Then at the back end, we can figure out which sequences came from which site based on the barcode. So we can use bioinformatics software tools to search out the barcodes, group the samples by barcode, this gives us a great sort of population survey of the bacteria. So we would get an average of about 10,000 reads per sample. So that's about 10,000 bacteria that we've been able to identify from our samples, which is a really great, uh, great method. It's much better than any other sort of culture-based or any other clone library-based approaches to profile communities. So now on to the data. So, the most important part of the data, I think, is the sediment triclosan concentrations. So this is what we saw. So our urban river upstream, 107 nanograms per gram in the sediment. This is really, really high. This is one of the highest levels I've seen in the literature. Not surprising. It's an incredibly urbanized area, the north part of Chicago, huge population density, significant wastewater inputs. So extremely high concentration at the urban site. The downstream was 33 nanograms per gram. The levels at the suburban site were significantly lower, but still measurable. And the woodland was basically at the detection, at or below the detection limit. So basically nothing in the woodland site. Now, the first thing that should jump out at you about this data is that my hypothesis was totally wrong. Right? I thought there'd be more downstream of the affluence and there's more upstream. So first I thought John had screwed something up and mixed up my samples. But I don't think that's the case. So I was surprised about this. Right, why there was more stuff upstream than downstream. And so we did some further investigation of our sites. And it turns out that if you look at the urban river, there are actually 18 combined sewer overflow inputs upstream of our upstream site. So a combined sewer overflow is basically a pipe that enters into a surface water like a river or stream. And so when there's a high rainfall event, that pipe shoots into the river untreated wastewater. and um, and stormwater. So when there's too much rain, all the water just goes into the river. And the justification for that is there'll be so much dilution that even though we're throwing tons of pathogens and waste into the water, it'll be so diluted it's not a problem. We can't handle all the water anyway. And so I didn't realize this when we were designing our, our study. And this information is not that easy to get. Everybody knows where the treatment plants are. You can see the pipes, you can see the plants. But these CSOs are not that easy to, to know about. We actually had to do a Freedom of Information Act request to get this information from the city of Chicago and to, to build this map to figure out where all the CSOs are. So on my figure, this is the north side treatment plant. This is my sampling site. Each of these little sort of buttons is a CSO. And there's a couple of them that are paired together. So there's 18 of them upstream of my site. So these could potentially be receiving untreated wastewater. So really high concentrations potentially of triclosan coming in not all the time, but periodically when there's a big event. So I think this makes perfect sense, that that triclosan could then go to the sediment and stay there and result in these high upstream concentrations. So I think that was a really interesting sort of result. Um, I'm not as sure what's happening with the suburban site, although these two numbers are not statistically significantly different from each other. There are some other wastewater treatment plants upstream of my upstream site, but they're a few miles upstream. So I think the basic thing at the suburban side is just all of these treatment plants, these smaller plants, are contributing a small amount that's giving us a little bit of trickle sand in these streams. And then again, nothing in the, in the woodland side. So even though my hypothesis was wrong, I think the result was still quite interesting. The other good thing is that even though it didn't fit my hypothesis, we did get a really nice sort of gradient of trickle sand concentrations among our sites. So we go from a really high level to sort of intermediate levels and then to basically nothing. So it did let us ask some questions about triclosan effects. So 
one of the things we looked at was bacterial abundance. How abundant were the bacteria? And there were big differences in abundance between my sites, but it didn't fit with triclosan concentration. Right? So if I tried to look at a correlation between bacterial abundance and triclosan concentration, you get nothing. Right? So there's no correlation. So triclosan is not driving bacterial abundance at these sites. However, if you look at triclosan resistance, there's a big difference between the sites that sort of follows the pattern of triclosan concentration. So this is my urban upstream site, urban downstream, suburban upstream, suburban downstream, and my woodland site. This is the percent of bacteria able to grow on those plates at that elevated level of triclosan, that's 16 milligrams per liter. So you can see this nice pattern, high, high resistance levels at the urban sites, significantly lower resistance levels at the suburban sites, and then the lowest resistance level at the woodland site. So, and if you look at the correlation between triclosan concentration and resistance, there's a really nice log logarithmic correlation between triclosan concentration and the percent of resistant bacteria. So R squared of 0.7 and a really significant p-value indicating a really significant correlation. So this to me suggests pretty strongly that the triclosan concentration in these sediments is impacting the communities. It's not controlling their abundance, but it certainly seems to be driving the increase in resistance among the communities, that they're getting more resistant to triclosan when they see more of it. So I was really excited about this. I thought this was a really interesting result. There hasn't been much of this in the literature demonstrating a real link between triclosan in the ecosystem and a potential environmental effect. The other thing we looked at was community composition. So I don't want to spend too much time on explaining these figures, but basically what we did is we took the relative abundance of different bacterial species based on our pyrosequencing data. So the pyrosequencing data will tell us sort of a rough idea of what species we have and how abundant they are at each of the sites. We have found, you know, thousands of species. So it'd be hard to look at all that data at one time. So we used a multivariate ordination technique known as multidimensional scaling. So this creates a two-dimensional ordination of our points. So each point on here is one of my sites. So the squares are all of the woodland sites, and I have five replicates of the woodland sites. On this graph, if two sites are close together, it means their communities are very similar in composition. If two points are far apart on the graph, it means their communities are not similar to each other. So what you can see on this graph is a very nice clustering of some of the sites. So the woodland sites were different. This is the, this is the urban upstream. This is suburban upstream. So some interesting clustering of the samples by site, but then all of these white ones, that is sort of a mishmash of the suburban downstream and the urban downstream. So there do, are differences in my communities at my sites, but again, it didn't follow the triclosan concentration. So I'm going to show you this graph again, but I'm going to replace the points with the triclosan concentrations at those places. So you can see the highest triclosan concentration here, then it was here, so there's no pattern that fits with triclosan in terms of the community composition. So how did I do with my questions and my hypotheses so far? So the data we have certainly confirmed hypothesis. Uh, well, actually, no, it didn't confirm hypothesis one exactly, right, because of the CSO influence. But certainly there was a measurable amount of triclosan in these urban streams as a result of anthropogenic inputs. So there was clearly an effect of triclosan on concentration. So that was interesting. And we also saw that triclosan exposure did select for more resistant communities. So a clear sort of environmental effect. What we did not confirm was hypothesis two or four, that the triclosan would reduce abundance or would select for the communities. Now, in retrospect, this is not surprising at all, right? These are extremely different sites, right? radically different in population density, in land use, in inputs, in everything, basically, right? For us to think that triclosan would be the only driver of abundance or of species diversity was not really realistic, right? It wouldn't make sense that triclosan would drive everything that much. But clearly, our field study demonstrated that there is an environmental impact of triclosan in terms of those resistance levels. So in order to get a better handle on our other hypotheses, we decided to do a model stream experiment. So a control experiment in the lab where we could remove all of those variables that are present at these different sites. So 
we did this in the artificial stream lab at Loyola. So in, the, in lab Loyola in Chicago, in our biology building, we have on our roof a greenhouse that contains 48 of these uh, model streams. These are four meter long, we're circulating artificial streams. The water, these are all empty in this picture, but the water flows around these streams driven by these paddle wheels that are connected to a motor. So you can put water or sediment or whatever you want into these streams. You can run water around them to model what a real stream flow would look like, and you can control the flow rate. And you can do replicated experiments with different model streams. So we decided to use this to test the effects of triclosan. So here's our basic design of our experiment. And this is one of our streams with our sediment in it. So we took six streams. Uh, this is the size of the streams, four meters long by 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters. We did limit the light a little bit just to limit the algal growth. It didn't prevent algal growth, but to keep it under control. If you don't shade these things, they're in a greenhouse. The algae grow so profusely that they start to climb out of the stream. So you need to shade them a bit to keep the algae under control. So we made up an artificial sediment, right, which is made up of a small amount of pea gravel, sand, and then organic matter in the form of shredded leaves. So we took leaves, shredded them up, leached them to remove the tannins, and then added the leaves to bring us to about 2% organic carbon, which is the same level we see in our woodland stream. So a realistic amount of organic carbon. We then added, we used dechlorinated tap water as our water. We had to refill the water weekly to replace any evaporative loss that we had. And we added as a microbial inoculum 100 grams of sediment from our woodland site. So we put in real sediment to provide bacteria and algae that could then colonize the stream. So we ran the streams for two months before we did anything just to let the microbes colonize and sort of get stabilized in the stream. Then we chose three of the streams randomly and added a one-time dose of triclosan to three of the streams. Three streams were left as a control. Now the dose of triclosan we chose was kind of tricky. What we decided to do was to add an amount of triclosan that would exceed, because our goal was to get it into the sediment. We wanted to get it into the sediment at a concentration that mirrored our urban site. So what we did was we added triclosan to the water at a concentration that would exceed the solubility constant enough to get that target amount into the sediment. That was our plan. So we added that amount of triclosan in sediments, just one time sediment, one time addition. And we sampled prior to dosing and then every seven days after that for about 34 days to see what would happen to the communities. So the triclosan did not affect bacterial abundance. We were really surprised. This is an antibacterial compound. We added it at a fairly high dose. It didn't result in a dramatic decrease in bacterial abundance. We were sort of surprised about that. But there was no significant difference between control and treatment on bacterial abundance. However, there was a huge effect of the addition on triclosan resistance. So in a relatively short period of time, so this graph shows triclosan resistance and the number of days. The black bars are the triclosan treated streams, and the gray bars that you cannot even see are the control streams. So a huge increase in resistance of the community in a relatively short period of time. We also looked at community composition of these streams over time. We looked at that at day 0, day 14, and day 34. And so what we saw was that the triclosan addition did result in a change in community composition. So here's our day zeros. The open shapes are the controls. The filled shapes are the triclosan. So at day 0, here's triclosan. Here's control. No difference between those two treatments. At day 14, here's control. Here's triclosan. They're sort of beginning to diverge a bit. And then by day 34, here's control, here's triclosan, a significant difference in community composition between the control and the treatment. So we were really excited about this. Right? We were able to use a triclosan amendment to drive an increase in resistance and a change in species composition in these you know, relatively realistic model stream communities. So we can then use the power sequencing data to look at the actual species composition to see which groups of bacteria are changing. And so I have a lot of this data. This is just a quick sort of snapshot to give you an idea of the kind of data we can get. So this is control day 34. This is triclosan day 34. And so you can see some of these groups are changing in terms of their relative abundance quite dramatically. So the blue shape of bacteroidetes, these are really common stream bacteria. You can see they're reduced quite a bit by the triclosan addition. The other thing that we saw that was quite interesting was a big increase in photosynthetic bacteria. So these cyanobacteria in yellow 
are photosynthetic bacteria. They're also called blue-green algae. And chloroflexi are a group of anoxygenic phototrophic bacteria. And they're shown here in red. So both of these groups expanded significantly with the tryptosan addition. So one thing that happened with the tryptosan amendment to our streams, which I didn't really mention to you, we didn't really measure it, was that it killed all the algae. And so previous studies have shown algae to be relatively sensitive to tryptosan. The mode of action is unknown because they don't have that target enzyme. So we don't know why tryptosan kills algae, but it does. But, and so we didn't set out to measure algae, but in our streams, we put the tryptosan in, all the algae, I mean, there was this massive algal die-off. Like all the algae from the sides of the streams died. So I'm wondering if the death of the sensitive algae created a potential niche that the photosynthetic bacteria, who might somehow be more resistant, could have potentially have killed. So I thought that was one sort of interesting result here. We also saw a decrease in proteobacteria, uh, a gram-negative file that are also really, really common in streams. So I think this data provides us a lot of interesting tools to build further hypotheses about different groups that might be more or less sensitive. So the conclusions from my model stream experiment. Sediment bacteria, bacterial communities quickly adapted to triclosan exposure. So again, I was surprised that we didn't see any death of bacteria in these streams, but I'm, what I'm wondering now is if it was just too quick. Right? We didn't do our first measurement until a week after the addition. I wonder if there was some die-off within those first couple days, but then the communities recovered as they developed, quickly developed resistance, or the more tolerant organisms grew in abundance to make up for the death of the sensitive ones. So it seems like these communities can adapt really quickly, and we're seeing a rapid increase in community resistance. So they seem to be developing resistance and adapting to triclosan pretty quickly. But we are seeing significant shifts in community composition and as well as that interesting increase in the photosynthetic bacteria. So some of the things that we want to do in the future with triclosan is to focus on that short-term response, see if we can get a better handle on what's happening in that short term to see if we do see more of a negative effect. Explore some of these differing sensitivities that we see in different microbial taxa. Focus more on functional responses and also to explore the possibility of doing some field amendments of triclosan. Not to dump triclosan into an entire stream, but to maybe do some field incubations, maybe of some sort of microcosms, where we could do some even more realistic experiments with triclosan amendments. Because the initial study of doing different rivers with different concentrations, there were so many other confounding variables, it was impossible to draw any real conclusions. So that finishes up the triclosan part of this work. But I, I want to spend just a few more minutes discussing one other part of this work that I think was really quite interesting. So when I showed you that data for the bacterial abundance and the community composition, there was no effect that we saw for triclosan. But there were significant differences between our sites. And what jumped out at me was the significant effect of wastewater effluent. Right? So this is urban up, urban down, suburban up, suburban down. So significantly lower bacterial abundance at both of the downstream sites. And then look at the community composition. This is urban upstream, and this is suburban upstream. So upstream, the two communities are different. But then downstream, the two communities now are totally mixed together. They've both changed in the same sort of direction. So the effluent has had the same effect on communities from both the urban and suburban habitats. So I was really interested in following up on this. So we did a few additional bits of work to follow up on this idea, to sort of ask what effect is the effluent having on these sediment communities? And this is a really important, at least to me, a really important question. Right? In urban areas in the United States, most of the wastewater gets treated through wastewater treatment plants. So the water comes from your water source, like if you're in Chicago, you get the water from Lake Michigan, you put the water into your house, right? you use it, you apply all kinds of stuff to it, like detergents, and antibiotics, and soaps, and lotions, all kinds of, of organic compounds we add to the wastewater. It goes to a treatment plant where it gets treated, and then it gets released to a surface water. And so every day, the wastewater from 72% of the U.S. population gets treated in a wastewater treatment plant. And this accounts for 42 billion gallons of water per day. So every day, we're taking 42 billion gallons of wastewater, treating it, and releasing it to surface waters. So that's a lot of water that we're putting into the ecosystem. And in a lot of places, this can represent a very significant fraction of the flow 
of those receiving systems. So here's Chicago. There are 15 treatment plants in the Chicago region. So all these things shown by blue, these are all treatment plants. 15 of them on this map. There are seven that serve the city of Chicago directly. The north side plant was where I did my, my study for that, the North Shore Channel. And the Stigney plant, people might have heard of, is the largest treatment plant in the, in the world, the largest active sludge plant in the world. So there's a lot of these plants. If you look at how much water they treat, you add them all up, 1.4 billion gallons per day just from those seven treatment plants, 1.4 billion gallons. So that means every day there's 1.4 billion gallons of water coming out of Lake Michigan, going through these, our homes, through these treatment plants, and then into the surface waters in Chicago. And if you look, for example, at the Chicago River, 70% of the water in the Chicago River system is effluent. So 70% of the water is effluent. So if you've ever been to Chicago, right, you take one of those nice boat cruises down the Chicago River, that river is 70% treated effluent. And even in the suburbs of Chicago, a lot of those streams are 60, 70, 80% effluent in terms of the flow. So there's a the potential there for huge impacts. And so people have studied a lot of the impacts of effluent on things like, of course, pathogen release. Right? Everyone wants to know if there's pathogens getting out into the water. That's been studied quite a bit. Nutrient quality, I mean, uh, nutrient loading, water quality issues have been studied a lot. And of course, eutrophication, right, increases in nutrients leading to potentially hypoxic conditions. All these things have been studied quite a bit. But there's very few, hardly any studies I could find on what happens to the native organisms when they receive all of this effluent. And I haven't seen any studies on this that are in major metropolitan areas. So it turned out that our triclosan field study was actually ideally designed to answer that question, right? What's the impact of effluent? So we had these two sites, right? So the urban site with a large treatment plant, the suburban site with a smaller treatment plant, and we had samples upstream and downstream. So we decided to look at these in the context of effluent impacts. So we looked at nutrient chemistry in the water and the sediment. So what did we see? Suburban and urban site upstream. If you compare the two rivers themselves, they differ significantly in nutrient concentrations. Higher things like uh, DOC, water column nitrate, water column phosphate at the suburban site because there's more ag land there, more potential inputs from ag land and from people's lawns in the suburban site, not as much in the urban. So the two streams on their own differ in nutrients. Both the streams were affected by the effluent. In both streams, the effluent increased concentrations of nitrate and phosphate. So higher inorganic nutrients at the downstream sites. The other interesting thing is now our two downstream sites are basically identical to each other. So we've taken two streams that were different in nutrient chemistry. And now because of the wastewater inputs, they're basically identical in chemistry. When you look at their concentrations of nitrate and phosphate and sediment organic matter, the water column DOC is a little different and the ammonia is a little different. But remarkable similarities between the two downstream sites now. So the anthropogenic input has totally changed these ecosystems. And it's reflected in the microbial communities. This is community population size based on plate counts and direct counts. You can see it both at suburban and urban. So this is suburban, this is urban. The dark bars are the upstream sites. The lighter bars are the downstream sites. So significant reductions in bacterial abundance at both the downstream sites. This is opposite to what other people have found you were increasing levels of nitrogen levels of phosphorus. That usually stimulates microbial activity and microbial growth. Usually you get more microbes downstream of an effluent. Here we're seeing, in both cases, less. I uh, didn't see an effect on respiration, so I'll jump over that one. And then again, our community composition. This is the same data I showed you earlier. I just pulled the woodland site out. So suburban up, urban up, and then here's the two downstream sites. So two communities that were distinct at the upstream sites are now indistinguishable. So we've now basically sort of homogenized these communities because of the anthropogenic inputs. We also saw significant decreases in diversity at the downstream sites. So with the Shannon Diversity Index and this thing called the Chow One Richness Estimator. So this is an estimate of the species abundance, I'm sorry, species richness at each of these sites. So how many different species do you see? So both the Shannon Index and the Chow Estimator both 
significantly decreased by the effluent. Again, another negative impact of the effluent. And we can use our pyrus sequencing data to look at individual microbial groups, so proteal bacteria, delta proteal bacteria, chloroplexy. So we see a number of these groups that are being significantly impacted by the effluent. And so we can use this data to go in and ask questions about what these organisms are doing in the environment and why they're being impacted. We can also look down at even finer scale. So this is sort of large bacterial taxa, like proteobacteria, bacteroidetes. But if you go down to look at even the species level, we can ask which species are changing dramatically between the upstream and the downstream sites. And you saw a number of bacterial species that have changed uh, quite significantly. So for me, there are a couple of really interesting outcomes to this uh, study looking at wastewater effluent. One is based on this concept that's, that's, that's popular in ecology known as biotic homogenization. So biotic homogenization is a process by which distinct communities of organisms become more similar over time. And this can happen in any type of communities. It's been studied most frequently been studied in birds and fish. And so natural phenomena can lead to biotic homogenization. Right? So during, during the, the uh, in geologic time, changes in Earth, uh, in the continental structure, movement of continents can create biotic homogenization. But recently it's been noted that human activities can also drive biotic homogenization. In other words, everywhere that humans go, we tend to make our ecosystems the same. Right? Every city in the United States has McDonald's and has Starbucks, and we eat remarkably similar food and we take the same medicines. Right? and we try to grow a lawn in the front of our house, and we use Scott's turtle to grow the lawn, right? We make our ecosystems more similar. And so this could potentially be driving organism communities as well. And no one has looked at this idea of biotic homogenization in terms of microbial communities. They've looked at it again in macroorganisms, also in plants, but not so much in microbes. And so I think our data is suggestive that effluent could be potentially a driver of biotic homogenization, that all over the country we're putting tons and tons and tons of effluent into these streams that could be making streams that should be really distinct based on their native habitat more and more similar. And so there's concerns about this in terms of reductions in, biologic, in you know, global biological diversity and also impacts on, potentially on ecosystem, things like ecosystem resilience. So I was really interested in that idea. The other interesting aspect of this that came out of it is the overwhelmingly negative impact of the effluent. Again, like I mentioned before, most previous studies had shown that nutrients coming from effluent should stimulate microbial growth. But what we saw was decreases in bacterial abundance, decreases in diversity, so lots of negative impacts on the effluent, even though there were significant increases in inorganic nutrients, which the microbes should like. So this leads to a lot of questions about what is it in the effluent that's driving this negative effect. And so the obvious question, of course, is what other kinds of compounds, like potentially pharmaceuticals, personal care products, emerging pollutants, might be in these effluents that could be having these negative impacts on communities. And so this, this work has really gotten me excited about doing more work looking at what kinds of potential uh, emerging pollutants might be in wastewater that could be driving some of these negative effects. One tiny little anecdote about this that I think supports this idea of the potentially being antimicrobial compounds driving this negative response is one of the most significant changes we saw in our species composition was a dramatic increase in a group called sphingobacteriales. So they represented a fraction of 1% of the community in the upstream sites, but expanded to almost or over 4% of the total community. So that's a big change in the downstream sites. Sphingobacteriales is known for being a very strange bacteria because it actually can eat antibiotics. It can actually break down and degrade complex organic molecules, phenolics, and some antibiotics. So potentially, if there's antimicrobials in this water, maybe that's what's stimulating the increased growth of sphingobacteriales because not only can they handle it, they can potentially be eating those compounds. So that's all I have for today. So uh, again, this work has sort of gotten me excited about the idea of looking at this whole wastewater stream and how the things that we put into wastewater could be affecting communities in ecosystems. I should mention all the work I discussed today was all work funded by ISTC. 
So it was focused on trickle sand. I have a few other projects going on in the lab that Nancy mentioned, looking at other kinds of pharmaceuticals. So we have projects looking at things like antihistamines, caffeine, uh, other types of drugs that are used that could affect some microbes. We also have a project looking at the potential and environmental impacts of nanomaterials, another class of interesting emerging pollutants. So we have a big project looking at the potential ecological effects of nanomaterials. So we've kind of taken some of this work and expanded it to other potential compounds in addition to triclosan. So uh, I want to thank everybody at ISTC again for the support and the funding for this work, and again thank my collaborators, especially Emma and especially John, for his great work at measuring these triple sand concentrations, which I think is not a very easy thing to do, as you can imagine, in these nasty urban sediments that I sense here. So thanks very much. Thank you. Hydrophobic and low solubility. Is there any information about it being either liquid or something that yeah, you know, you know, I don't, I don't know specifically the mechanism, but I do know that it does have a tendency to bioaccumulate, so it does get into the fats in some of these organisms. So I know that it does have a tendency to bioaccumulate up the food chain, so it could potentially affect food chain. I'm not sure about the microbes in the fish and whether they would be affected by that or not. I'm not sure. There are organisms that ingest sediment along with the food. Right. It would seem they would be likely to have a big impact on their gut flora among other things. Yeah, that's true. It's our, you know, we haven't looked at that at all, but that would be an interesting thing to consider. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, yeah, one thing I was wondering about, you've got one point below these, or one sample set of below these blue colors. I mean, it seems to me, I don't know how much money you got to work on this stuff, but, you know, you need more points downstream. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we would like to do a sampling sort of downstream to see if there's a gradient, see how things change with distance. I'd like to do more sampling upstream. I'd like to do sampling, sampling seasonally to see how these things might change and also to go to sort of a wider range of sites. So I, I agree completely. It was what we could do with the resources that we had. Yes? Yeah, uh, thank you guys for the picture. You saw your experiment on the control and the, the add the temperature to the, to the at the BHG. Okay. And uh, for the control, you have uh, like a zero day, seven day, and uh, 34 days. So what is the difference uh, in your controls? So why the your control aspect is awesome. Yeah. So in terms, of, in terms of community composition or any of the, any of the barrel? Yeah, I, I mean, so these streams were run for two months prior to the experiment. And so our goal was to get them stabilized as best that we could. But they're not stabilized after two months. The communities are still changing a bit and evolving. I'm not evolving, but developing after two months. Um, so I don't know how, we haven't run, I mean, I don't know how long it would take for the community stop changing in these artificial streams or if they ever would, or if they would constantly be just adjusting. So yeah, that's, we see that, we run a number of these artificial stream studies looking at different kinds of things, and the controls are never completely stable. No, but that's what I would like to do also. Like I would like to take a sample directly from the effluent, like the pipe. What I would want to do is measure the trichosan in there, but then also measure the bacterial communities in there to see how much they could be contributing to what's happening downstream. That would be another great, a great potential project. Yeah, I just got a comment possibly upstream with AI. Downstream with, uh, no, the, uh, downstream with all the I concern about the effluent concentration of the protein alone. So the base is starting to come up yeah, the th we, went, we went upstream, well, we stayed close downstream because I'm not sure how far the trickle sand will travel. And that would be a great, we want to look at that in another study to see how far it will travel. So we went upstream farther because we were worried about some of these effluents have a amount of backflow.
that when they come into the stream, they don't just go all downstream. Some of them go up a bit, especially the North Shore Channel, because the water comes out of the effluent so rapidly, there's some upflow. We wanted to make sure, so a colleague kind of went in and sort of gauged how far upflow the water would go. We wanted to go upstream enough to avoid any of that backflow. That was why we designed it the way we did. But yeah, it'd be much better to have several downstream sites to look at a potential gradient or how long that impact lasts. If you've got changes in the uh, microbial community, you've got all these cyanobacteria showing mess, you've got clarity in the water column because it was knocked out the fire pump there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and, and, and you're going to have impacts on Benthos on, on bivalves and snails. And sure. I wonder, and, and they are not doing their normal thing, I assume, because they're probably hammered, so they're not processing nutrients and not feeding those diseases. But you're looking just at the snapshot of bacteria and cyanobacteria in the absence of these other things. Sure. And I, I wonder if in the future, in addition to sampling, be able to sort out these active phenomena more streams, you might do well to include some of these other taxes. Uh, in terms of the model streams or yeah, in the field? Yeah, yeah. The, the model streams, which I think would benefit from more uh, small particulate sediment, yeah. and, and, as well as perhaps therapies like the surrogate organic. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I agree. I think that would be great, a great addition. great to look at things. I would like to look at things farther downstream and see how long the impact sort of lasts. So I agree with that. Um, and interesting thing about the city of Chicago is that the city of Chicago, all these treatment plants that we've surveyed, they don't uh, disinfect the effluent before it's released. So a lot of municipalities in the United States, most major, major cities disinfect the water before it's released. So they essentially kill almost all the bacteria before the water goes out. They don't do that in Chicago. So there is the potential for the effluent itself to introduce some organisms into the system. But people that have looked at that question, in general, organisms that come out of the effluent don't survive very long in an actual stream. Right? The conditions in the treatment plant, high aeration, you know, uh, a fair amount of organic carbon, the conditions are very different than they would be in the stream, especially in the sediment. So in general, those effluent organisms, while they can be transported a bit and might make some contribution to what we're measuring, they're not going to be the dominant players in the sediment. But, but the, 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 the person asking the question is correct. You get a better handle on that if I had done two things, if I had sampled the effluent itself, which I would like to do, or if I had also gone at more sites downstream to do a more, more of a longitudinal study. Uh, I'm not sure. So all of the all of the stuff that I've shown you today, all of the sampling we did was always sediment. So the microbes, both in the field study, the artificial streams, and in the work looking at the effluent, all of that was sampling sediment or benthic communities. So the top layers of sediment. I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but um, you know, in the, 
in, this, in the model stream experiment, I thought we would see a decrease in bacterial abundance, at least initially, and that they might recover over time as they develop resistance or the resistant organisms increased. We didn't see that. So my thought is perhaps we didn't sample early enough, that waiting a week was too long. And we should have maybe sampled one or two days after addition or for several days after addition to see if we saw that. Because it is a pretty toxic compound. We get it at pretty high doses. In the field, I think the this, this streams are just so different. And it's so complicated that there's so many factors influencing abundance between nutrient concentrations, uh, organic carbon concentrations, size of the streams. There's just too many things that are different for triclosan to be the only determining factor, I think, for abundance in the field. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't. I think if the triclosan concentrations stay elevated, if the concentration stays there, there would be a selective force. Uh, favoring more resistant organisms. So I would expect the concentrate the resistance level to remain high if the, the stressor stays there. Okay. Um, 